welcome on board the original Captain Scott's Royal Research Ship Discovery. My name is Ali and I'm the Director of Ship and Facilities here for Dundee Heritage Trust. And you join us here in what was, since the 1923-25 refit, this was the deck lab on the weather deck and this is where an incredible amount of scientific research would have been carried out as well as a very noticeable part of the expedition because a lot of what was brought on board was centred into here and then separated into different areas. Um, I'm very, very lucky to say that we are not working single crew on this one today. We can discuss a lot about what was taken um, on board this ship and also the type of scientific research that was carried out on the subsequent Royal Research Ship Discoveries. So of course this is just the first of four. Um, so Richard, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, yes. So, so I'm Professor Richard Lampitt at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton and I'm what's called a biogeochemist in modern parlance, which is somebody who tries to understand the link between the biology, and the chemistry and the physics, physics being the way the water sloshes around. So I've certainly spent quite a lot of time on the, as uh, Ali says, on the fourth of the Royal Research Ships Discovery and on the third one. And uh, so it's an absolute delight to be here on the original Scots Discovery and to touch its timbers and, uh, and be in the science lab. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you because obviously one of the big things that we focus on is what was done in Captain Scott's time before it became a Royal Research Ship Discovery. It was originally this SS or SY Discovery, but it was the beginning of that scientific research and the, the themes that they created were obviously why Discovery seemed like the right ship for that refit and for moving on uh, into becoming the first ever Royal Research Ship. Uh, and the, the aims and ambitions they had for it. And it, I think this weekend, when we were lucky enough to have the fourth discovery in the same city in Dundee, the same place as the discovery, the original discovery was built, and it really has really nicely tied together those themes of the old, new, and the legacy of that original scientific research, of which I believe you have an incredible copy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, what I really like about being here and being on the new discovery as well is this link, the, the way the really high quality science was carried out on this ship, and that legacy has carried right through. So in the early days, clearly it was as technical and as, as sophisticated as the modern ships, but the principles are absolutely the same. They're doing really high quality science. So what they established here was the way to do science. And although a lot of it was focused in the early days on whaling industry, there was a tremendous amount of natural science, tremendous amount of it looking at the biology and the chemistry uh, of the water. So here I have a discovery report from the discovery investigation. This is volume eight, published in 1932, and it's looking at the microscopic plants, the phytoplankton of the ocean. And it's actually got some really important observations, which I think probably a lot of people are not aware of, re reported in this. There were some 35 volumes, were there, something like that, last published in 1980. But they really Which I find think, incredible. Yeah. You know, yeah. so much was collected. It was wasn't until nineteen eighty before finishing the publication. Yeah, just yeah. just incredible. And shows just how much it, they were working to learn what was so unknown. And to this day, to a large extent, it's still unknown. Yes, I mean the the how the biology and chemistry and physics work together is tremendously important now. I mean, a lot of the things which another thing which really intrigues me is that things which were done for natural curiosity then actually turn out to be really, really important now. You know, actually how our climate is changing, mm -hmm. how increasing pollution, the stresses on the fisheries, all these things, in order to understand them, you've got to know how the system works. Mm -hmm. And the principles which were established here, I mean, not just because I'm British, this really did establish a very, very high quality of research. Yeah. And publishing these sort of volumes, not just the explorer saying, oh, what about this and how about that, actually writing it down. Yes, yeah. it's, it's extraordinary. And that's the thing, and to go back on something you were mentioning earlier on, that the whaling part is not something that's as often discussed because it's not as uh, you know an attractive thing to discuss in today. And it would be lovely to think that the discovery was built with pure scientific and the love of, of the marine life in mind. But there was an element of political elements and there was funding involved in that because whaling unfortunately did bring so much money in through taxes and landing and oil and so on. To Dundee. To Dundee, Dundee, Dundee yeah, yeah. And, and to the Falkland Islands where the discovery was then re-registered for. 
um, that that led to the part of the idea of what the RRS ships then did. It started off with commercialization as part of its idea. Mm -hmm. And it is incredible to think that there's still an element of that even to this day that is driven by a quest for knowledge, but also an element of to make things more economical. If you're looking for fuel or you're looking into the future of how these ships could continue to do the work. Mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting one. So, of course, on board this ship, you technically class it as a hybrid because it does have the auxiliary engine, but it has wind power it uses the sails as well. Um, and it's interesting that now the conversation is starting to go back on should marine vessels be going exploring when one of the things they are doing is using diesel fuel and, and working through it. And it's a really interesting element of the next steps onto that one. Uh, is there much that you're involved in yet on how that could impact on the oceans? Have we changed the way we do things? We are trying to change and we will change. And the next ships will certainly be much, much more environmentally uh, since they have a much smaller footprint, as we call it. Um, certainly at the moment, we're very mindful of that. So, for instance, I mean, obviously we never throw rubbish overboard, nothing like that. But the, the, big, the big footprint of actually having a ship steaming and create, uh, generating CO2 is something we're very mindful of. And the new ships will be much, much better at that. We're also using quite a lot of, a lot of autonomous vehicles now. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't, they can't do everything, but these are vehicles that go down and up completely autonomously. We set them going, we launch them from a ship, yeah. and away they go. Um, and every time they come to the surface, they transmit the data by satellite. And so this is, this is great. It's part of the story. We still need these research vessels, yep. in my view, and we will for a long time. Yeah, and definitely it's something that I'm, I'm confident of, that there will be future RS discoveries. So the beautiful number four that we have along just from us at the moment, that will not be the last of the RS discoveries. No, I don't think so. Absolutely not. And I'm also completely confident that the very high standards that were set up on this ship will continue, and we won't have... Uh, a vessel which is just for economy. Uh, I mean, sure, it'll have the, as you say, have the the British flag on it and uh, demonstrating that we're doing a cracking good job. But uh, it'll be doing very, very good research into the future. And it is fair to say that you know the work that was carried out on this ship and the the other three afterwards, they are viewed around the world as quite you know is up there. Uh, yes, I've I've sailed with a lot of uh, international cruises. Uh, explorations on other, on other vessels, and certainly what happens in British oceanography is, is really revered. It's really, this is the way we should do things. Having cracking good scientists, well, I guess you, I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> 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 also, speaking for you. <laughs> yes, speaking for you. Having very good scientists and having excellent uh, crew and officers and a whole load of land-based people as well, sorting out the, the, the explorations and handling the data. It's, all, it's a big enterprise, and it's, it's done with an extremely high standard, which I'm very proud to be a part of. That. Fantastic. Yeah. And of all of the different experiments over the years, is there similarities you still point to in either methods or equipment that are used? Yeah, yeah. Some of the methods we use have a, have a lot of what we'd say backwards compatibility, and which is really great. I mean, particularly the, the simplest one, I guess, is the what we call the zooplankton net, the plankton organisms that that, that drift with the currents, mm -hmm. and these small shrimpy-like guys. And we use nets which are very, very similar to the ones used on this ship. Uh -huh. um, well, there's a fantastic photograph of Alistair Hardy yeah. standing on the deck, and there's one just being lowered down or raised up. It's hard to tell, but still. Um, but yeah, yeah, so yeah. very much similar. Absolutely. And I've used these, these ex nets almost exactly the same, lowering them slowly down to perhaps 200 metres, bringing them up gently, filtering the water as it goes, and you end up with a little pot at the bottom, mm -hmm. which are these zooplankton, which are the food for a the fish, and then they feed themselves on the microscopic plants, the so called phytoplankton. So it's, yeah, it's really nice to yeah. use those, those techniques. And just again, that, that lovely continuation and that legacy of the original discovery and you can see why we're here just now celebrating 100 years and it's, it's fantastic to think that in another 100 that what was carried out on this ship will still be those base studies, those base samples that continue on and, and scientists will look back to the discovery for 
that's sort of in Dundee now, and they look back on what they did and think 100 years later, how do we change? And that fantastic, continuous experimentation, yeah. it's, it's incredibly part of it. And certainly from my point, being able to work on this discovery, it certainly means a lot to me, and I'm sure the same for you. Oh, uh, absolutely. And they, I mean, associated with it, these, the discovery reports, the way the, the discovery collection, which still exists, and in most of it in Southampton now, um, some of it in the Natural History Museum, and that's of some of the specimens collected on this ship and still stored in perpetuity um, for study in the future. There's a lot of neat techniques now available, looking at DNA, for instance, uh, looking perhaps at some of the pollutants also in these organisms, which are much less than. So a lot of work can be done, but having these specimens right just 100 metres from my office, think, wow, that's totally awesome to have those. It is incredible, and like I say, it's, it's been a fantastic weekend and being able to celebrate that that 100 year link between the two ships so close together now. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it has been an incredible time, and uh, it's been a pleasure to meet with you and, and to welcome you on board where it all started. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for me too, it really has. I appreciate it. Very good. <laughs>